So I like basically what I did in this PowerPoint is I put together all the pictures that we took from the convention. And what we did is we all got in a Dodge Caravan in the middle and three people in the back, and then we basically just separated who had to sit in the middle seat in the back. <laughs> so I think I got front on the way down, but Steve had to sit in the middle. Uh, and then we switched off halfway through because that was not going to work for the whole ride. It was about 12 hours. I had 10 hours of driving, and then with stops and gas, it was about two hours extra. So it was about 12 hours the whole way from Lansing to the hotel we stayed at, which was in New Jersey. And it was basically like the hotel was right by the top, like the you come out of the Lincoln Tunnel and then go over the sort of bridge, and right there was our hotel. So it worked out because it was what maybe 15 minutes, 20 minutes of commute. So the the bus stop we had to walk. That actually probably was longer than the bus ride. I think to the bus stop. And it was really it was the worst because we would like you could see the bus stop from the hotel, but there was like I don't know traffic and then like two like heavy rail lines and so we had to walk over this bridge and anyways but yeah so the the bus stop was kind of far away but the bus trip was pretty quick and that worked out really well because the bus basically took us right to Port Authority and then from Port Authority we walked to the convention so that worked uh, and so the convention highlights basically the way the convention works is you have tech talks which you had to pay for like with the little convention pass and then the expo was basically just booths that you can go talk to all these different companies and I just pulled some of stuff that I had pictures of that I remember. There are a ton more than what I put on this like short little list. And with the tech talks they were actually really cool. There were a lot of them. These were the ones that we talked about or that I went to or that we like remembered. I don't know do what do you guys want to talk about that specific one? I know you two went to some really cool ones. Do you want to talk about it? Sure. Uh, yeah. There were uh, there I guess how many talks did we actually go to? So in one of the talks, there was this guy. So George Massenberg uh, is basically this really crazy producer, but he also did all this uh, really important circuit design. Like he designed one of the first really good, maybe the first uh, parameter. Parameter. Yeah, parameter EQ. As a consequence, he was really, really legit <laughs> about what he was talking about, and. Uh, Totally, totally awesome guy. Uh, there was him, and then there was this other guy who was also really important. Uh, Saul Walker. This guy worked, or I guess, did he found API maybe? So, yes. I think he did. He also designed uh, some of the first usable uh, EQ stuff, I think back in like the 50s or 60s, or maybe early 70s. The 500 series uh, format. What's the model number? They can just pull it. Oh, like a 525 or a 500. Yeah, so, so right. So really, also like a really important piece of equipment basically for studio guys. So we went and saw those guys talk about uh, how they designed the EQs and everything. And probably, there were two really important things that they said, I thought, and that was, uh, the first thing was that they talked about, they would go through and design all these EQs and stuff, and they would do everything by the book and work it out all on paper, and it should work just fine, and then they actually built the things and they sounded like, like crap, basically. <laughs> and so then, what they would have to do is, uh, is tweak things by hand and, and figure it out and get like an intuitive kind of understanding. And so the second thing they said that was really important was that they had to do tons and tons of revisions on these things to actually get something that worked and sounded good. But I guess before that, my idea had always been, as long as I do things the way I was taught, then things should just work out the first time and be okay. <laughs> but that wasn't really the case, so that was kind of interesting. The other talk that was really good was done by this guy named uh, John Dawson at Arkham Amps. So these are like uh, apparently really high quality amplifiers that they pull them up. So they look very fancy and I think they perform well as well. Oh, but anyway, so, so basically one of their main uh, circuit designers came and talked about uh, power amp design. Uh, and it was basically like uh, it was like an ECE course done in like two hours. <laughs> but he just like sped through and sped through 
But what was really great was uh, he actually talked about like the practical side of things, and he, like he would tell you about transistors and stuff. But then he spat out some things uh, like general rule rules of thumb and things to watch out for in design, which uh, uh, you don't always get that in the classes. Uh, it's kind of nice to see that. The other nice thing was that he gave us really awesome references for uh, books and parts too, like uh, parts that he used that he really liked and that we could use as well. So I like that a lot. And then, I can't remember what else. Basically, the money we spent on the talks was totally worth it, and going to New York and all that was really awesome. And my general feeling too about AES was that going to, to classes and stuff here is fine, but you don't really get the inspiration. I mean, no offense to Dr. Wurz, <laughs> but I, I mean, it, it is inspiring, but uh, if you Sorry. like, if you really love audio and you go to this place where you see these guys that are really, really awesome and they're like doing audio and making a lot of money, it's kind of incredible. <laughs> and so there's this kind of switch that happens when you're watching them uh, talk about this stuff that you also really enjoy. And for me, it was kind of a nice yeah, awakening period. It was really great. And so now when I go home, or I have like this extra drive when I'm working on my stuff. Uh, which, you know, like I, I work on stuff already, but it was, it's, man, it's like, it's a nice, it's a brighter flame, I guess. It's, it's really great. But, uh, we, yeah, we call so it going to the mouth. Huh? We call yeah. it going to the mouth. Yeah, it's audio, man. Yeah, man. Okay. So yeah, it was, it was really good. <laughs> I think like building on that, one of the cool things too is that we would go to these talks and there'd be like what, like maybe 20 people in some of them, 30, and then like you would go to the convention, there'd be people everywhere, but then you like got that apart and sort of like sifted out all the people that weren't really all that interested in it. The people there were really like, this is what I want to do, I want to listen to talk, and it was, it was really cool. Another good thing was that the, uh, the people attending these serious talks, it was basically us and companies and and old serious men yeah <laughs> there were i think a couple talks but yeah we were probably the only ones that were like yeah still in college and everyone else was yeah way older like which made it kind of really cool though in a lot of ways because they had legitimate insight to the stuff they were talking about so some arguing yeah that was the best yeah we uh, we went to one talk where uh basically there was an argument from this guy that built this really uh high power high fidelity uh ab two amplifiers. And he was arguing that class D amplifiers are not as good because they get pushed into saturation on a sharper curve than AB do. And the gist of what happened is he presented all this <coughs> stuff and then multiple people in the audience were like, that's wrong. You're completely wrong. <laughs> you need to read more of the AS journals because you're just wrong. And it was kind of, I don't know, that was nice because it was like, hey, there's rigor. That's awesome. So, and then one of the interesting talks I went to was actually uh, from a student who was an intern at Sennheiser. And uh, he was presenting material that he did on uh, what's called basically laser vibrometry. And he was using it as a, a drum trigger. So when you put a microphone on a drum, obviously there's like six other drums around that microphone. So you get a lot of bleed of other drums. And what he did is he put the drum on like a snare and then a laser on the snare head. So every time you hit the snare, it triggered the laser. And then you had that recorded sound as well. And they were both basically time, like the same spot in time. And then he used that laser trigger in his sort of mixing software as a trigger to turn that microphone on. So it split all of his kit up really, really well. So you could like get this really cool sound where you didn't have bleed from all the other drums because the laser was acting as a trigger. Um, so that's really cool because it was something that was, it's really simple. Like there's nothing too difficult about that, but it was kind of like an interesting way to approach that problem. So yeah, so those are the tech talks. They were really cool. And then the expo was really interesting as well. I have a ton of pictures, so I can just start with those. But yeah, so this is the intro to the expo. So it was all in the Jacob Davids Convention Center in New York. This is a giant, basically, glass box. Um, like, it literally is just like, it's like a pole barn that they use glass instead of like a tarp on. The AF convention was all back in here, and it was like two football fields in the current. A lot of what I did is I just sort of walked around and took pictures of stuff that I liked. <laughs> so one of the cool things, uh, no, Peter's freaking out. There were all these, no, too far. There were all these like really cool mix consoles that I found. Like, because pretty much anyone that made a mix console obviously brought it to AES. But a lot of them were like incredibly high end things that I was nervous to touch. The one in the top left hand corner is entirely digital. So for each sort of channel, you have your fader, and then there's another screen that like corresponds to that top panel. And on that screen, you have basically a digital EQ that you can click on and pull open. 
and it's all adjustable, like the parameters are adjustable with the little knobs on it. It's crazy. Um, this was an eight channel, all tube uh, mix console that was really cool. Unfortunately, I didn't get to play with it because there was literally a line coming off of it, people that wanted to listen and mix stuff. Uh, this is one of the cool API consoles that they're coming out with. I just like that it had all the VU meters at the top stacked, like the whole thing. Um, and then this was a really cool Gordon preamp. Um, I talked to the guy that makes those for a little while. And one of the cool things about them is the output impedance on the preamp is six ohms, and the input impedance is two mega ohms. So that's like crazy. All right, that into like preamps. That's that's like really really good. One of the cool things about it is since the the input impedance is so high, it doesn't really draw any current off the microphone. So there's like it's just really flat. It's really cool. Just he had the top open, and literally his the Gordon guy, his table was like that, and then a, like a pile of papers, and he was just sitting there. So yeah, I went and talked to him for a while because he. Was really bored, but it was cool. And then Jacob, you went to the Battery Studios. Do you want to talk about that? At Battery Studios, it's it's a Sony studio where the majority of what they focus on is digital archival from the original tapes or whatever media they have. They go back as far as the like. Here's a here's a a metal platter from 1910, and all the way up to, especially when you get into the 80s and 90s and things started to get digital, they have a wall of all these different machines that can read different formats because there's just not a, an industry standard, or there wasn't an, an industry standard. Um, I also in that studio do a lot of remastering. And it's, it's quite a small studio. They had a staff of like six full-time people with two secretaries, and that was it. But a lot of cool equipment. The guys there, they know what they're doing. They just, what they know and what they're able to do is just outstanding. That was part of the AES convention, right? Like that was one of the things you could do if you wanted to to pay for it. It was an extra fee, but um, they bust you over there and then went up to the 10th floor. And also in that studio is the room where John Lennon last worked and he basically went down to the stairs and was killed. So they, <laughs> It hadn't really changed much in that room because it was an interesting thing. Yeah, so that's, yeah that was, that's a cool thing they let you do. Is they'll basically, like, as part of the convention, they'll take you like, to all these different places. Um, and it's like affiliated with AS. Uh, and those are just some compressors. And then, Jacob, you found that big cube, is that right? Yeah, that, that has really 12 cube. speakers on it. And those are all active drivers. And that company, that specifically is used for, uh, like in a hotel, they'll just make white noise and go on the other side of the wall and say, okay, is our wall, you know, soundproof enough? But the, the gentleman who worked there, we showed him the picture of our cube and Steve was talking mostly with him and his eye, he lit right up and he was like, this is his hobby uh, outside of work. And, uh, you know, just a lot of cool things. Behind it, you can't see it, but there's a black, it looks like a cone head and it just has an uh, opening at the top and it's actually designed for surround. And it's this really small thing. And they, they don't mass produce them. If they were to mass produce them, they'd be much cheaper and it would be a really easy solution for like home audio, but they just don't do it, so. So aside from the expo, obviously like we're in New York, so we're gonna go out. So we went through <laughs> Times Square Friday night. So there's some of the pictures. It was actually really cool. We walked from the convention center to Times Square, which took us, what, 25 minutes, 20 minutes? Yeah. It wasn't too bad. So yeah, we basically went, we like, we came in from the east, or no, from the west, so we walked east and then hit Times Square and then basically did a loop around and then walked back. Um, and it was crazy. It was one of the most congested sidewalks I've ever walked on in my life. But yeah, so that was Friday night, and then Saturday night, we had a contact, well, I should say that Ryan had a contact with Glenn Brown, you were talking about Glenn Brown and like why he's relevant. He's a local studio guy, one of, really one of the only ones. He's been working in the area since uh, the 70s and had a, had a fairly big studio called Audiograph in, uh, through the 80s and now and since uh, the 90s and up to today he's been doing a, a solo gig in East Lansing, just uh, recording people and designing and building studios uh, across the country. Projects with, with CBS and a number of other people, but yes, we were we were able to meet up with him on Saturday. Well, actually, he just told us about these. Uh, there were two parties that were sort of connected to AES. One of which was at this Quad Studios, which is sort of a 
basically this one and the other one, which was the Chung King Studios, almost it seems like almost all of New York hip hop in the in the eighties and early nineties, and really since then has been recorded in these two studios. It's crazy. So basically, yeah, he he let us know that this was happening, and, and we were able to just uh, just go in because we were part of the convention. They they let us in. And, uh, I don't know if you want to talk. Yeah, about sure. That. Yeah, and it was. Uh, Basically what happened is Saturday night, we weren't really sure what we were gonna do, and then Mariah contacted Glenn, who was at the convention, he said, hey, you should go to these things. And we're like, okay. So this one was right off of Times Square, which is what that picture is, in the bottom left-hand corner. Uh, it was on the 10th story of this building, and we went up in it, and literally the elevator opened, and it was basically this view. There was, well, that's not true, there's a pool table, and then some giant, like, saltwater fish aquarium thing, and then to the left was this hallway of golden platinum records. So you can imagine our reaction to that, like walking into it, it was amazing. And then to the right, there was a control room, and they actually had a band in the, the booth that they were recording and playing back in the control room, which was actually amazing as well. It was really cool. Uh, I thought these two things were cool. Uh, they did Coldplay's Parachutes album, and then this is Viva La Vida. You can't see it very well, but it, they have like the whole, just like all the discs of Viva La Vida and then all of the countries that it went platinum in on the border. Uh, so those are some of the cool ones, and like Ryan said, literally like every rapper hit artist, like there were too many of those for you to put up here. Uh, Tom Waits, Rain Dog, yeah. uh, and Metallica's little Kirby Hancock's, the uh, Perfect Machine, and the other 80s ones. Right. So just any tons and tons of stuff. And so we like walked into, we had no idea, keep in mind prior to this, we are just like, oh, it'll be like a studio. And to be honest with you, I was expecting like a business somewhere on the other side of Manhattan that we're going to have to like bus to, and then it was this. It was amazing. That was the first studio we went to, and then we went to Chung King Studios which was probably, in my opinion, more impressive. It was just crazy. That was right after we went to Quad. So they did the Fugees. This is Nelly. Um, there's literally a ton. Uh, they had a, uh, I, was, I can't remember now. No, I mean, the big one I'll get to that we all figured out. But the, this is the control room, the board. I have no idea how many channels this was, many. I did not count. <laughs> um, 72. Yeah, OK. It was crazy. But, uh, and so, and the other thing too that was cool about this board that we figured out, it was 240 volts, is that right? Was across the VU meters, is what they were using. So literally, I think at one point I put my hand right above the board, you could feel the heat just bleeding out of the little grooves in it. And that was insane. Uh, but yeah, so that was the board in the control room. Yeah, it was really nice. Yeah, and then those were the, the in-house monitors up at the top. Oh, it was Oxford. Both, both uh, Quad and uh, Chunky had these Oxford monitors. Yeah. So Quad's one. So you can imagine that the board was like raised up a little bit, like there was a, you had to sort of step up to the board, and then those were right sort of up above you like here, and inlaid in the wall. And this, the other, this is the other thing that blew me away, is this was on what, the sixth floor? It's like the third, I think. Third floor, yeah. And this is like, it's a giant, like there's a huge tracking room attached to this that you can see through some like plexiglass. But I guess just the fact that it was in this sort of high rise in, in New York, like just it was crazy. Like I could not imagine what they had to do with the acoustics in that. Um, totally discreet. So yeah. Like you would yeah. Never they were there. Exactly. Like that. I think the, the other thing too that made me laugh is like if you walk into the the recording room right in front of this, there's a door, and you open the door and you're on a fire escape, which makes no sense. Like that to me was just so weird. But the setup of this was nice because right through that window, you can uh, see the window. You can yeah. Sort of see. It's actually much higher. This this room is much higher than the actual studio below. So that it's kind of had the overhead view. It was kind of sweet. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It was. It was yeah, because there was like right immediately to the right, so you can kind of see that window. That's what this is up here. Because it's the window. But right here, there was like a vocal booth or like a little sort of area that was closed off from the rest of it. And then way back here, there was a bigger booth um, back in the actual recording room. But yeah, so those are the monitors that we're running. And these were really cool because they had like two active and I, I think he said both at the side were passive. Yeah. Yeah. And so they were really, they sounded amazing, but they were really cool. And right, both studios again had NS10s yep. for the secondary monitor. Yeah, yep, these two. After the tertiary, I guess. Yeah. That was cool. Um, so yeah, so the last picture here has significance. <laughs> we're all standing oh, yeah. back behind the board and we're just sort of like, this guy walks in and he was really nice. And kind of like he did not seem like someone I guess that you would assume has any real significance in this whole sort of studio scenario. Just real like hopping around, real nice. 
And then this guy was actually playing music. And so we asked him, he's like, what do you want to hear? And we're like, well, play something you record in this room. And then this guy walks in. Apparently, this is the guy that helped co-write and mix the Beastie Boys single, uh, Fight for Your Right to Party. <laughs> and so he like comes in, we have no idea. He just tells us that and then puts it on the thing. And then as they're playing it, he does this at every chorus, first of all. <laughs> and turns around, I think Steve and I are like, standing back and like, Ooh, what is going on right now? <laughs> Uh, and he like puts his fist up in the air and yell the chorus at us. And then this guy was just going along with it because he worked there. But then we like later find out that this guy said he did something for Michael Jackson. We don't know what. No. So as to whether or not he actually did, I don't know. He's John King. He's the owner of John King. Right. Yeah. No, we knew he was the owner. But I don't know what he did for Michael Jackson. I'm actually kind of curious. So, but yeah, so that's a good point though. He's the owner of the studio. That's the other thing. And he did not, like, he didn't, he did not care that we were literally all standing in the back of his control room taking pictures of everything. <laughs> um, but yeah, I thought that was kind of cool. So I have the picture now. <laughs> so, so he's the guy that had done all of this great, you know, for right. top recording, among other things. And he comes in all wasted. To break it out. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was really funny. It was insane. So. We should also mention that he totally stole this guy's girlfriend. Well, he did. That's, yeah, that's, I think that's who this is, actually. <laughs> yeah, he, like, he came over and he tells us all, like, like, when we asked to hear this stuff, he tells us all the stuff he did with his Beastie Boys record. And then he, you can tell he's dancing. And then this sort of like shadowed figure came in with this girl, and then he basically starts dancing with her while this guy's standing in the back with Steve and I. Like, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. It was crazy. But yeah, so that's, that's all the pictures I have. But I would say definitely next year. Next year it's in LA, I do believe. Okay. And I think October 10th, I want to say, is the date I saw. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's, it's definitely worth it. I would say that we all got our money's worth it more. It was one of the cooler things I've done in a very long time. It was definitely worth it for a career aspect and just like an audio thing. It was amazing. We met a ton of cool people. And like, Tom said it was, I don't know, you walked away from it and it was, I don't know, you're like sort of energized to like do all this stuff in audio now. So it was, it was all very cool. But. You mentioned how the recruiters were excited about electrical engineering. Oh yeah, I guess I can say that real quick. Yeah, I went to, they had like a career fair and honestly it was more like the corner tables and this big expo room, there were like six tables. But I went and talked with Sure, Bose, and uh, Harmon. Um, and I talked to the sure rep there and basically like he looked over my resume and I have a picture of the amplifier I built on it and he like freaked out that I was an electrical engineer. I think it pretty much everybody had this exact same experience where it was like you just kind of just said like oh yeah I'm an electrical engineer and they're like what? Do you want all the jobs that we have forever? <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. It was really like and it, honestly that's how it went. Like it was, I was in line talked to the guy at Sure, and the girl in front of me, he asked her, do you have any computer science experience? And she told him, Microsoft Word and Excel. <laughs> so when I came up, he said to me, he's like, okay. And he's like, so what are you doing? And I told him about, well, I'm in 404. So I told him I'm doing like resident stuff. I told him 412. And I think I told him something else. I don't remember, 366, so signal processing. And he goes, okay, well, which one do you like? Because we have positions for all of those. You can have whichever one you want. And I was like, what? <laughs> like, I don't know. And then the other thing too is that these people all gave us our business cards. So not only did we get these cool job opportunities, we also have contacts. So the people that like, if you're interested in something, if they don't have an internship or a position open, you can talk to these people and they can help you find something. So yeah, that was definitely an amazing takeaway from it as well. Yeah. Do you guys have any questions about the convention or anything like that that I can answer? Or yeah. So you had on there the there was one of the one of the presentations was on driving speakers and headphones. Yes, that was the one that uh, Tom talked about. The one on uh, the guy that basically it was like a big, like a, I'm trying to think of what class that would be. But it was basically like a big lecture, an ECB lecture. But yeah, yeah. Cool. He was from Art. Yeah, those were guys from Art. Yep. Okay. Yeah, he was interesting. Yeah, he was really fun. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, that was, because he actually, he, one of the cool things he talked about that you mentioned is he talked about, on the output side of stuff, he actually, he sort of did, aside from just the theory of things, but the things that actually, from doing it, breaking things, he sort of pointed out stuff like, well, if you do this, it'll probably break, so it's better to do it this way. <laughs> um, which is actually really cool, because obviously you don't get that necessarily in the classroom, you get that more from lab, from doing stuff. Um, yeah, he was, he was talking way too fast for some of it, but yeah. uh, there are uh, audio recordings of all of these lectures, so. That's right, yeah, that's the other thing too, is that everything that we saw, there's a recording of. So I'd like if if you're interested in like seeing maybe some of the stuff that there was talked about, I have a schedule saved in my laptop of all the talks. Um, any talk that they gave, you can buy the recording. But I don't know about do we know about written material? 
Did you talk to anybody, Steve? Yeah, that's right. The slides you have to get up from the individual presenter. Okay. They, they won't publish those. You have to talk to the right. Yeah. Bother for them. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But recordings you can buy for what? Fifteen? Is that right? Sixteen. Okay. So so yeah, if there's something that you're really interested in and actually want to get the talk, you can get it. So and most of them were about an hour and a half, an hour 